guys. Uh, like she said, my name is Ali Stuckey. Thank you all so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and I've already been inspired by what you guys have to say. Um, like she said, I'm a host at CRTV.com along with a lot of other conservative voices. She listed a few of those, Michelle Malkin, Mark Levin. Um, I host a podcast called Relatable on a weekly basis. I produce multiple videos a week on CRTV crtv.com. And really what I focus on is tackling the cultural myths that a lot of young people are encountering today, whether that is on Instagram or Twitter or what you see on TV. Really, it seems that anything that is spoken today has somewhat of a liberal bias. And millennials and Generation Z, since we are the people who uh, consume this information the most from those platforms, we are really the most susceptible to that bias, which is why you see millennials in particular really latching on to these liberal talking points without really thinking for themselves. So my job is to step back to slow down and to assess every issue from a logical perspective. Now, I've never claimed to be anything other than a conservative Christian, and so I never claim to be unbiased, but what I do try to give is an honest and relatable take on what I believe to be the most relevant issues today. Um, one thing I've found in this analysis and in my work with millennials and with college students is that millennials and young people really want to know why. We care a lot more about the why than we do the what. And we have a very hard time attaching an issue uh, to our lives if we don't understand why it matters to us. That is true politically. That is true professionally. It's also true on a personal level. Uh, so my goal in everything I do is to give my audience a clear why behind what I believe um, and also give them information to kind of form what they believe as well. And one issue in particular that I've been tackling for the past two months is this Me Too movement and why we need to be skeptical of the movement and why we need to be hesitant of jumping in feet first. Um, because the reality is, no matter how much genuine compassion and integrity and love filled the movement at the beginning, um, the fact of the matter is, is that the direction that it is moving is very dangerous for society. And that direction that it is going in is to emasculate men and to make them passive. Um, and the reason why I'm talking about this to you all as a group of women, because we as women are going to be the ones suffering and we are the ones that have to make sure that it doesn't happen. So first, let me back up. Just in case you've been living under a rock or maybe you don't watch the news and if you don't, then that's perfectly fine. More power to you. You might have something better to do. But just a refresher on what the Me Too movement is. So it's actually something that started a while ago, but it resurrected last year after the Harvey Weinstein allegations came out of sexual harassment. He's a big time Hollywood producer. Um, and like I said, I think at its heart, the movement might have had very good intentions. I certainly stand with victims of sexual assault and violence Violence, and I think that their voices need to be heard. But as most trends go, especially trends that are born out of Hollywood, it has come out that there are some very serious flaws with the movement. Um, after the Weinstein or Weinstein, I don't really know. I didn't know who he was before this. The Weinstein allegations arose. It seemed like every week there was another story about another producer or a celebrity or a journalist um, that also had allegations leveled against them of sexual harassment. Um, some of these accusations we learned were overblown and some of them were accurate. But what we learned is that the common thread, it seemed, in all of these things was men. Um, these were mostly, if not all, male perpetrators. So being the very clever investigators that they are, uh, the mainstream journalists as well as influencers decided, hey, if men are the common denominator in all of these things, uh, well, then men must be to blame. So the headlines that we saw, especially in the beginning of the movement, were filled with phrases like male privilege, uh, like male power and toxic masculinity. Women in Hollywood very quickly banded together and formed some sort of army against the men who a year ago they were applauding and respected, but now were morally opposed to. Um, at the Oscars most recently, you probably all remember Jimmy Kimmel saying that Oscar was the perfect man because he had no male 
male genitalia because apparently that is the qualification for being a good man. And then a few days after that, we saw that the Hollywood Reporter had a cover of the cast of Silicon Valley um, glorifying what they called the beta male. Uh, so rather than talk about the issues, the real issues that our country is facing, like the values that we've largely abandoned, like morality and respect and common decency, they instead shifted the blame in large part to men and not just guilty men, but all men whose masculinity was what they call toxic. Now, if you ask progressives what the heck it means to have toxic masculinity, you will get a wide array of answers. But mostly what I found is that they mean men in positions of power. So any man that is even assertive or aggressive or has authority has toxic masculinity. They believe that toxic maleness is uh, the cause of not just sexual harassment and sexual assault, but what they call gender disparity and also tragedies like mass shootings have all been blamed on this concept of uh, toxic masculinity. But really, whether they say this explicitly or not, what they mean is that toxic masculinity means that men who do bad things do so because they are male. And so the progressive logic goes, if they are doing th these things because they are male or because they are masculine, then the solution is to make them less traditionally masculine. So we need to encourage men to be quieter, to take a back seat, uh, to be less aggressive. Uh, if they were just weaker and gentler, then maybe we wouldn't have so many issues. Um, this line of thinking isn't anything new. It is an idea that progressives have promulgated for a long time. The idea of absolute gender fluidity, the idea that your gender is completely detached from your sex. They think that true quality is only going to be accomplished when we acknowledge the fact that despite our differing anatomy, that men and women are essentially interchangeable. Um, you have seen this, probably this unscientific nonsense all over your timelines. It's definitely uh, not unique or new. So they believe that bad behavior that is born of toxic masculinity will go away when we get rid of toxic masculinity or when we get rid of masculinity in general, we will all live in our new progressive dystopia. Um, and that's really the sad thing about this Me Too movement is that something that perhaps could have been a movement of honesty and integrity has been hijacked and manipulated as a vehicle to make men passive to make them more like women. The problem is that's not going to work out well for any of us. Why? Because men are different than women. Any serious person knows that there are biological and therefore inherent differences between men and women. And I'm gonna tell you some radical knowledge that I guess is not being taught in schools anymore. Uh, men, because of their makeup, are generally more aggressive and task-oriented than, than women are. They are stronger and they are faster than we are. Uh, they have this thing called testosterone. I don't know if you've heard of it. They have it in higher amounts than we do. It highly affects their behavior. Um, from a young age, most, most boys, not all boys, but most boys are interested in... Um, beating each other up and breaking things. Whereas girls are interested in the opposite. We are interested more in creating harmony and cultivating beauty. Boys tend to dress up like superheroes. Girls tend to dress up like princesses. And this is not because of some contrived patriarchal dichotomy that's been constructed by society to subdue women. It is innate. Now that doesn't mean that all men have to be the same. It doesn't mean that all women have to be the same. All it means is that naturally men and women generally have inclinations toward different things. Uh, there was recently a piece in the New York Times about state-sponsored gender-neutral preschools in Sweden. I don't know if you guys saw this. Uh, the children at these schools, sometimes as young as two and three years old, are taught to behave in a way that is contradictory to what progressives would call gender stereotypes. So little girls at this school are taught to yell no and to break things and to be messy, and little boys at the school are taught to dance and rub each other's backs. That is real. Um, so, but what they found is, even in the New York Times, is that once they 
I, I don't know how you poll two-year-olds, but I guess once they studied the actions and behavior of two-year-olds, they found that yes, some of these kids might be less likely to stereotype people by their gender, but they are no less likely to behave in a way that corresponds with their sex. So they found that even after a year of indoctrinating these little kids with gender nonconformity, that the little girls were still acting in a way that corresponded with girly things. They were still drawing women with makeup on. That was the number one thing they were drawing. They were still asking teachers to hold them whereas boys were still hitting each other and being aggressive, which forced the New York Times to admit that maybe, possibly, this could be because of science. Shocking, shocking revelations. Um, as you probably know, there are youth drag shows now. Young boys who dress up like girls are celebrated. They are glorified. They go on the Ellen DeGeneres show. Their parents are seen as these uber-tolerant heroes. I mean, these poor young boys, whom I believe to be the victims of child abuse, are being held up as symbols of what, progressive, what the progressive left has wanted for years, and that is the weakening and the feminizing of men. Now, okay, that might just be an extreme case. Not all men, no matter what, are going to start dressing up as women. But what happens when men are not just completely emasculated, but encouraged to be passive, to take a back seat, to be quieter or less sure of themselves? What are the consequences of male passivity? Well, here are some instances of when men have been passive throughout history. Uh, if you go back all the way to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, you have Adam and Eve. Eve, yes, she was the first person to take a bite of the forbidden fruit, but Adam's first sin was passivity towards disobedience to God. Another biblical example was Pontius Pilate, who, instead of doing the wrong thing or t doing the right thing, he listened to the masses and he delivered Jesus to be crucified. The story of Julius Caesar and Brutus, they both exemplified a passivity that ended up leading mur uh, Brutus to murder Caesar. And then if you fast forward to the beginning of American history, we see that Aaron Burr's constant passivity led to his own demise, as well as to the killing of Alexander Hamilton. Before World War II, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's passivity led to the Munich Agreement, in which England and France uh, decided that they were going to cede Czechoslovakia to Nazi Germany. He thought that appeasing Hitler was going to lead to peace, and as we know, that did not work out well. Uh, JFK's passive stance during the Bay of Pigs has led to more than 50 years of oppression in Cuba. And let us not forget here in Florida, in the Parkland shooting, uh, the deputies who refused to engage the shooter who murdered 17 students here in Florida. So their passivity played a large role in the death toll there. Um, these are just a few individual instances, but we see that passivity in men, something characterized by a refusal to take responsibility and an avoidance of leadership, is a sign of moral decay, not just on an individual level, but a societal level as well. Take fatherlessness in America, for example, which has increased by 16% since 1960. Now, there might be lots of reasons for a man to abandon his family, but they all ultimately point to a shirking of responsibility, to passivity. The impact, as we know, of fatherlessness is devastating. Children who grow up without fathers are generally more depressed than their peers. They are at far greater risk for incarceration, for teen pregnancy, for poverty. 71% of high school dropouts are fatherless. Boys especially suffer without a dad. Boys raised by single mothers are twice as likely to be delinquent. 26 out of the last 27 deadliest mass shooters were fatherless. A lack of a strong masculine figure in a child's life often leads to a cycle of crime and abuse. But that's actually not it. Psychologists who study the minds of sexual abusers have narrowed down that one of the main reasons men rape and assault women is to compensate for a lack of control or a lack of authority in other parts of their lives. So they're feeling emasculated or in other words, passive. So emasculating men and encouraging passivity is not going to lead to fewer cases of Me Too. In all likelihood, it's going to lead to more. Confident and strong men don't assault women. Weak, insecure ones do. Passive masculinity is a disaster on multiple levels. And that is because men are not supposed to be passive. 
They are by nature meant to provide, to protect, and to lead. Now, that does not mean that all men have to be macho bodybuilders who only like hunting and fishing. And that does not mean that women are excluded from positions of power. You all are strong women with voices. I am a strong woman with a voice. I obviously believe that courageous women are necessary to a flourishing and equal society. But it does mean that men have a natural tendency towards protection and leadership that should be encouraged and trained, not denied and shamed. Yes, men have certain characteristics that might be harmful when they use to when they use them to abuse rather than to protect, but does that really make them toxic? Don't women have our own characteristics that when used wrongly have a toxic effect on society? Which is why it's better that we teach our boys and girls humility, kindness, compassion, and respect of all people, as well as how to use their unique and inherent strengths in a way that positively affects their families and communities. We should be instilling them with time-tested virtues rather than indoctrinating them with the pseudoscience of gender nonconformity. History and science both tell us that when men exchange their propensity towards action, responsibility, and leadership for passivity, Devastation normally ensues. Encouraging men to abandon masculine characteristics for feminine characteristics is not going to solve problems, it's going to create them. More specifically, the tragedy of sexual assault that characterizes the Me Too movement is not going to be abated by passive men, it's probably going to be exacerbated by it. So we, as sisters, as mothers, as wives, as friends, have a responsibility to grab hold of this cultural myth and change the narrative. We have to refuse to be manipulated by people who tell us that because we don't agree with this part of the leftist agenda that we're regressive and bigoted. This all starts in our own lives, in our own homes, the way we talk to our families and our friends, even the messages that we put out on social media, the blogs we write, the speeches we give. This particular thing is not about winning an argument. It's about saving our future. Thank you. Okay. I think I do have time for questions. So something really interesting um, you were talking about is the movement towards gender fluidity. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the history of the feminist movement, it started as you know, women are different. That's why it matters that right. we're part of the conversation. Um, and then you see in the 60s and 70s in the sexual revolution, it's like we have to abandon our femininity in order to achieve equality. And, you know, that means birth control and abortion and just pushing away the things that make women so different but also so wonderful. Right. Um, how do you think this new movement of genderlessness um, coincides with fem? feminist history, as well as, you know, what is the end goal here? Do we want masculine females and feminine men? Like, what goal does the left have in perpetuating this horrible ideology? Yeah, well, I think you did a really good point of pointing out the cognitive dissonance that I don't even think that they know that they have. You ask what their goal is, and I don't think that they completely know. Um, I think that gender fluidity in general is what they think is going to achieve true equality, that it's not about being masculine or feminine is what they're probably saying. You can just be whoever you want to be, love whoever you want to love, despite literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of sex corresponding with your gender and procreation, they have decided to abandon that for what they call progressive. Um, so I don't think that they really know their goal and do progressives ever really know the implications of what they are lobbying for? No, not really. Um, I think it's just a way they think if you weaken women then, or weaken men, then that will make men stronger. But to me, that is a counterpoint to what they're actually trying to prove. If they're simultaneously trying to prove that women are so strong and powerful and independent, you shouldn't have to weaken men in order to prove that. And so what I would like us to get to, and I think what we can lead as conservatives, is that, well, we know that science is on our side. It's never going to change that women have more estrogen than men do. So if we take advantage 
advantage of the unique talents and the strengths that we have, then I truly think that women are a force to be reckoned with. Once they, once we live in the unique talents that we have and, and what we can do as opposed to what men can't. Um, and I think also it's shifting our perspective from thinking that men and women are competing against each other um, and thinking that men and women are complementing each other. That's what it's supposed to be. We were created, whether you have faith or not, we were created by God in order to complement each other, not to be egalitarian, not to be the same, but to complement one each other. That means we're different in a good way. Something I've noticed in addition to the Me Too movement is kind of the emasculation of men when it comes to the abortion argument. Um, I hear I hear women say all the time, um, if you're a man, you can't have an opinion on abortion. You don't have the right to speak on it because it's a woman's issue. And I've seen that in the media as well with writers like Matt Walsh and Ben Shapiro. They're always um, demonized for having an opinion on abortion. I just want to know how we can um, include men in the narrative and make sure that they're not being silenced. Well, it takes two to tango, first of all. So I'm pretty sure that men do have a say in it. They had a say in it when it happened, is all I'll say. As I'll, <laughs> this is explicitly as I'll go. Um, but so they do literally, scientifically, have a say in it because the baby came from somewhere. Um, but also, I think that since when do we exclude people of certain genders from issues that are scientific and moral? That is what abortion is. It's not a philosophical argument. It's not a religious argument. It's not a gender argument. It's a scientific and moral argument. I don't see why just because they're male, they have a smaller capacity to understand what it means to dismember a human child. And they're also hypocritical in that. Um, they are okay with men being as pro-choice as possible um, and being outspoken about abortion. They're not okay with men being pro-life. Um, so that's really the dissonance there. They're extremely extremely dishonest when it comes to that. And I think that you just have to peel back the layers and say, this is not a gender issue. This is a science issue. Ben Shapiro understands science a lot better than you do, Linda Sarsour. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Katrina Fee, and I'm from New York. And my question, especially regarding the Me Too movement and how it went a little too far, became a bit of a witch hunt kind of after and then also other elements of liberal feminism. Um, I ask you, why do you think um, liberal quote unquote feminists um, take the victim seat time and time again? Because I can't seem to wrap my head around that. <laughs> Because victimization leads to government dependence, and that is always the goal of the left. Um, so if women are no longer victims, then they don't need feminism, and they don't need the government to help them. Um, so they are simultaneously caught in this. I know I've said cognitive dissonance like 12 times, but that's because that's really the only phrase that perfectly defines the progressive ideology. But they... They are simultaneously saying how awesome and powerful and independent women are, how we can do anything we want to do. Oh, but you need Planned Parenthood, third wave feminism, free birth control, abortion, and the government and welfare to help you. Um, that's not to say that all of those things necessarily independently are inherently evil. There are, you know, good parts of birth control, good parts of government assistance sometimes. Um, but to lump all of those things together and say, you know, this is the feminist starter pack that here you go, here's what it means to be a powerful feminist. You have to depend on all of these institutions because you can't do it on your own. Um, I think it fits into the progressive ideology um, because they are, it's a cycle. You are, feminism is unnecessary if you are not also a victim. That makes sense. Last question. Ooh. Okay, um, go ahead. My name is Alyssa. Uh, I'm from Ave Maria. Um, my from question, where? Ave Maria University. Oh, yeah, It's cool. in Naples, Florida. Yeah. Um, my question is how we can combat this soft despotism that, uh, the feminist movement and the reliance on the government, um, like, how do we combat that uh, as young women? Um, I feel like often we feel like, oh, I'm just 19, I'm just 20. Um, and, like, how do we stand up to the government and do that kind of thing? Oh, that's a really great question. There, I mean, there's a lot that you can do, but a lot of it is just kind of living your life as a conservative, obviously, the way that you vote. And what you talk about with your friends and the way that you lead your life in a way that is independent from the government and not vying for the same things that they are. I mean, that sets you apart right away. And I think that proving to them that you can succeed without the help of third wave feminism, um, 
is really the biggest testimony and the biggest tool that you have. Being a successful conservative flies in the face of what every liberal believes, that you need the government and you need feminism um, in order to be successful. So it's not so much a matter of necessarily what you do, but it's just kind of the way you carry yourself and you conduct your life. Um, I personally, and when people ask me if I'm a feminist, I say no. They say, well, aren't you for female equality? Yes, of course I'm for female equality. I don't need a mainstream and secular label to put on what I believe has been right and moral forever, that women have equal worth to men. Um, I, I just don't believe in that. And the way that I combat that is by being successful without them. So I don't know. That's kind of a general and simple answer, but that's, that's my take. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. I loved this. It was great.